Okay, so thank you very much um, for coming. I very hope that you get something out of this presentation, and I very much appreciate your attendance. So I'm um, doing an inaugural speech, and I didn't really know what should be part of it. But when I got the letter from the rector, I went home to my children, because my husband had to go training, so I had no one else to talk to, who were two and three, and I said to them, I'm now a professor. And they said, what for no? <laughs> so that was my guiding phrase. So I think if I can explain what I'm doing in this one hour, I'll feel a little bit better. A few weeks later, she actually asked me, why am I now a princessor? That one's for another date. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I'm not a princessor. Okay. Right, so what is it that characterizes our research? So I've chose to do this as an overview. So I'll go in a little bit about the past and a little bit about the future. And there'll be snippets, so I hope you get something out of it, but you could always ask for more at another point. So the part of our characteristics of research, like other design, many other design areas, we focus on improving the product or the product service system. And we do this by trying to improve the product development process or innovation process. And my research mainly has been product development process, but is now moving more and more into the innovation processes. And how do we do this? One of the things I learned in DTU, you have to draw everything as a little cartoon. So this is to Mons Andreasen, whose style of drawing. We work as a team where we observe. If you think of this cloud as the fuzzy front end where you have your ideas, then you go through a process of design and you get a product. In this case, it's a Rolls-Royce Aero engine and then this product goes into service. So we observe the product either being designed or the product in service in order to better understand the product and develop some fundamental design theory. And we try and use this as the basis and foundations of design tools and methods. And these design tools and methods, these are focused on industry. So we hope as our goal, not only to increase design theory, but we really want to make an impact to Danish industry and industry in general. So how do we do this? Firstly, we work very closely with industry, some, sometimes through direct funding, but other times through data collection and verification of our tools. And what, I, what we adopt, or what I have very much, I think, has been um, one of the first movers in, is adopting a multidisciplinary approach to tackling design problems. So we take perspectives of computer science, for example, natural language processing or ontologies, we also take a fundamental understanding of engineering, knowing how a product can be broken down, what the function is of a product, um, what the product development process is. And we will also take an understanding of design cognition, so understanding of how designers design. And we couple these three elements of fields to tackle research projects. And sometimes we do this by partnering with people, and some of them are sitting right here, who are the psychologists, and others in other in, uh, institutions. So just to talk a little bit about the industry, as Biera said, I was previously in Cambridge, where mainly we were driven by the aerospace industry. And that, that was because the group was funded by Rolls-Royce and BA Systems. And this type of um, work is um, challenging because these are what they produce, aero engines. They have thousands of components, and I think around 700 engineers are involved in the organization and design of this um, um, aero engine. So some of the challenges there are the complexity involved. Since moving to Denmark, I was fortunate to work with many different companies and changing fields around. So we've moved to work with Arca Solutions, who are a Norwegian company that make drilling equipment on oil drilling rigs, and together with Mass Drilling, who make the rigs and the platforms themselves. But also to moving to consumer products, such as um, with Gianetcom, who I think are also here somewhere. Um, and Stelton, who are more design-driven. But we're working also with groups of SMEs on a global product development project. So why is design and new product development important? Well, I think the world needs design and new product development. Otherwise, you have no products, basically. But why is it important for Denmark? Denmark has a small company and a developing land with a lot of production moving away from Denmark, is one of the top players in innovation and has always been in the top four or five in the European Innovation Scoreboard, which means understanding how to do design and being at the front end of it is very important for Denmark's economy in the future and today. Looking from a research perspective, 
if we look at the NSF, which is the American um, uh, funding body, and their engineering design 2030 vision, they say globalization is here to stay. So globalization is becoming a more and more driving element of engineering design, which results in challenges to current product development models and challenges to current innovation models. So and quite exciting to see what the future is going to be here. The Engineering Physical Research Council, so the UK Research Council for Engineering, has identified knowledge and information management as one of the key challenges and grand challenges within the area. So taking a step back, what is the product development process? There's many different types of processes, but one very generic one is this stage gate model here, where we have some sort of a fuzzy front end before with lots of ideas generated and planned. And then one of these becomes a project going through concept design, some system design, testing and production. And the approach that we use, like I said before, is to observe this process and go and closely work together with industry to understand their way of working in order or to understand the product once it's already in service. So to work with the operation people or the service engineers and use this to improve the, both the process but also the product. Part of the product development process is this um, concept design and system level design. And in here, this process involves creating lots of ideas. So this is, each of these little dots is an idea. And you may generate this on your own, sitting brainstorming, <coughs> or brainstorming in a team. And generally, this is accepted that there's a process of creating many ideas and then narrowing these down and then screening and coming back again. And what is widely accepted is that the wider this part, part is, the more ideas you can get, the better the quality of the idea that is chosen. So why, why is this important in design? Why is it important to understand this process? Well, you can think of a problem in terms of an initial state so you start with a, a situation and you have a goal that you want to reach and a process which can be called the operators to go from the initial state to the goal. And if we take well-defined problems like chess, you start with a, a chess board and the initial state is very clear where you have all the positions of each piece of the chess. And the final state is to capture the king, plus you had a a set of rules that determines how you can use each component. And this determines a well-defined problem. And because it's well-defined, computers can beat you at this. When we come to design, this is known as an ill-defined problem. And the reason it's ill-defined is because of many reasons. One, it's not always clear what you're starting with. We don't know what your starting information is out there. Second, if you were designing a music player, there's more than one solution. All of these are solutions, so you don't know when you've reached your goal state, and there's more than one goal state. And the th so through engineering knowledge management, we hope to increase this quality and understanding of the initial state. And through design theory, we hope to have a better understanding of what this operator or these processes are from going from the initial state to developing the final product. And also through creativity, we hope by supporting this problem-solving state, increase the chance of getting a better solution at the end of it. So I'm briefly going to say the current research areas, and then I'm going to go in detail about engineering knowledge management, and then come back to some of the other areas at the end. So some of the areas we work with are design thinking and design theory, and also interaction and emotional design, which I'll talk to in, in the end. And part of this is related to idea generation, so which, where the focus is increasing this problem space by looking at different ways of facilitating brainstorming sessions. So for example, we've done research together with MEC on using bio-inspired design as, as a possible way or using random images and seeing how this increases the novelty of the solutions that are created. So the current research interest is in this engineering knowledge management field. And I think for many years I worked just in this field and then I started going out of it. So you're going to see a presentation that mimics that, I'm afraid. So started with engineering knowledge management. In the old days, this is what a studio looked like. It was typically the sharing over an open offices, sharing a drawing and that using that as a way of communication. And there was less a need for formal communications. 
But as design has become more and more global, this need changes. And some of the challenges in engineering knowledge management is to look at complexity of the product, which comes from the complexity of the number of components or the process that you're going through and how to manage this so you're not dependent on tasks of each other, how to model the function, so how to model the components and the design of the components and what the intention is when you're designing it, how to support decisions. And some of the research we've looked at is also how to classify documents automatically in a way that engineers can understand it. So the main goals of this research has been to improve the product development process and also the, pro um, the product through understanding the people who are the designers in, in this case. So when we look at product development processes, there's three views that are widely accepted. One is that you start with many alternative product concepts and then you increase the specification of the product, which leads to a reliable product. Or an information processing view where you have input and, in, and processing of a lot of information until you have enough information to produce the product and actually sell the product. And a third view is a risk management perspective, where there's a lot of risk at the start of the product, um, product development process, and through the process you assess and reduce this risk until you're confident in the product in its functionality and that it could be received well in the market. And all of these views aren't really independent of each other, but depending on which industry you're in, one view is more important than the other. And we look at the first one through the creativity and design thinking research. And we look at the other perspectives through the engineering knowledge management research. Okay, so going back to our problem solving model, now I'm gonna take you through a case that was taken place in Rolls-Royce. And um, where we've got this initial state and the goal state is to design this aero engine where there's thousands of components involved. And one of the challenges that were Rolls-Royce was facing then and is still facing in some ways, an aero engine takes a long time to produce. So the product development process takes four to five years. So one of the consequences of this is that if you're employed in the company, it takes you a long time before you can be exposed to many different types of problems and therefore building up ex expertise takes a long time. And they say it's around eight to 10 years here. Also changes in the career patterns. I think previously um, there was a more an apprenticeship type role in Rolls-Royce where people would come in, be trained there and stay there typically 30, 40, 50 years. Now people tend to change after three to four years. So this, meant that this means that it's harder to build up this expertise. So Rolls-Royce was interested in understanding what is this process that designers do and how can we use this to make the process or the product better. So the approach that was undertaken was to carry out studies with the engineers while they're doing design tasks. So some of this was to use observations of design tasks. Others were discourses, which is essentially novice designers and engineering um, ex experienced designers talking together and interviews. And from here, what we could find is that first of all, Novice designers use a pattern of trial and error, which I think is pretty obvious, but what they do is you generate an I idea, you implement it, so you actually go and do your stress analysis and everything you need to do, and then you evaluate and decide if that was a good idea or not. Experienced designers reject ideas much quicker. They do generate an idea and they reject them in their head because they have the ability to pre-evaluate this idea. And the question is, what is that pre-evaluate in here? Some of the other part of the research is one that novice engineers do many more iterations. I think typically we say it's about three times as many as an experienced designer. And the iterations are longer in themselves because they require implementation. And experienced engineers have some sort of way of pre-evaluating these ideas. So what we found from this main part of research is that we did another study with the discourses and we found that novice designers they don't know which questions to ask when they ask experienced designers. So only around a third of the queries were the right question. And in 10% of the cases, the experienced designer actually says that you need to ask this question instead or provides other information. And this has a, um, a key implication for knowledge management strategies. It basically means that they're not asking the right question in the beginning. 
what we found is that there was a number of design strategies that the experienced designers used, and we call this CQAC, which I'll show you in a minute. And we found that by using training designers in these generic questions, we could reduce the number of inappropriate uh, questions that they asked. So the transfer to industry was the method that was developed, CQAC, was used to train their new recruits. So when you um, enrolled into Rolls-Royce, you go through a two-year pe period, and part of this is a design and make program, which is an eight-weeks program where you design part of an engine. And as part of this program, they first train you in these questions for all the new recruits that come in. Workshops were also run in both Rolls-Royce and BA systems to disseminate the results. And the method was used to structure the lessons learned database, which was made compulsory after each project. It also resulted in a shift in their knowledge management strategy. Until this point, they thought that they need to simply make all their documents electronic, and this will make the process of finding information easier. But instead, they started putting focus on how to assist designers in finding the right query. So this is what CQAC looks like. So this is eight different questions that represent this little um, pre-evaluate phase of an experienced designer. These are generic questions that I've taken out of the observations. And I won't go through them, but I can take one example, which is, for example, an experienced designer would consider, when designing a component, would consider the issues involved and think about the life cycle of the product, the functionality, the product issues, so for example, the weight, the geometry, the tolerances involved, the interfaces between other issues, so weight with costs, and also with other products, components, and assess which are, which are most important and which ones they don't need to consider. Novice designers instead do a checklist uh, approach. So if you've given them, they, I think in Rolls-Royce they have what they call hazard prompts lists. So they have about 60 issues. They would just go through every single one and they haven't got this ability to assess what's important for this task. So these questions became the templates for part of their intranet structure. Okay, so based on that findings, so there was a project that followed on from here. They became clear that the search criteria, when you're looking for information, is not clear at the start because you don't know which question to ask. And what we know is that many designers recognize information during the search rather than specifically finding it. And when they recognize information, this prompts how they act in their design activity. So from this, we interpret this in terms of translation to a tool um, engineers need assistance in formulating their query, and we need them to be able to recognize relevant design issues. So the approach that was used was once again this um, sort of computational psychological type approach. But just to summarize this part, the best Google is only as good as the original query. So if you ask the wrong question, you'll get the answer to that wrong question. So the challenge here in taking that perspective of how to guide the queries was in Rolls-Royce, there's typically 40,000 documents produced for every engine. And a study that was carried out previous to mine showed that these are typically used once a year by the person who wrote that report. And that's related to a number of issues. One, that you're not aware that this knowledge exists, that the report exists. And it, the second, that you haven't got the ability to get it easily. And the third, that it's maybe not relevant to your context. So, the approach that we adopted was to look at a visible indexing structure, which means how you search for information and retrieve information by allowing browsing rather than typing a keyword approach. And just to show you in context what we mean by indexing. So if you're capturing information, so say you're writing a report about the design you've just finished, you can either index it there and say what it's about. Then there's a process of learning and storing and retrieving. All this can be done automatic through the use of computational agents so that can go through documents and um, automatically index them. And the approach that we use is open to both possibilities. So in the, again, in this instance, interviews were carried out with both BA Systems and Rolls-Royce. And the, we tried to understand how can we describe or what the design process and the complexity in it in order to use this for indexing. And what we found is that engineers think in four main things. One is the products that they're working on and the component and the other components that um, interface with this. 
to the design process, so the, actually the steps that they need to go through, the stress analysis, for example, the actual concept and, and, uh, and detail design. Function, so this is what the product actually does. So what does it have to do? Does it need to turn air or compress loads or what does it have to do? An issue, an issue is a word that means anything else. But what it really means in this context is the functionality of the product, the life cycle of the product, the requirements of the product, and some things related to the product geometry. And we've mapped these to about 60, so these are relevant only for the aerospace industry and would be different from another industry. So from this, just to give an idea what those four, um, these four look like underneath, there are many different terms. So under these function ones, actually we've used some work from the United States, from Stone and Seikman, to, to look at nouns and verbs. And from these um, indexing terms, we wanted to create an approach that would allow designers to change their query. So they may search on one thing, and realize that this is the wrong thing, but try and understand what else could be relevant. So for example, if they searched on weight and unit cost here, in the purple you would see the other issues that could be relevant, geometry and material, for example, or manufacturing. You may see in yellow the, I actually can't see the colors, but the, <laughs> in yellow you might see the products, parts, and the other components that interface with each other, and you might see the functionality of the parts. So this would mean that as a novice designer, if you're unsure about your query, you can then change it and hopefully be prompted in designing. And this uses the theory from behind in psychology that designers, as well as other experts, work by chunking. So you group things together. So experienced designers don't think of just weight or unit costs. They think of all the trade-offs around it together rather than one thing at a time. So under this indexing structure, it can be decomposed by saying the design process by the subtasks, the function into verbs and nouns, the issues into these four main headings that I've already mentioned, and the product is decomposed, in this case it's an error engine, into all their subsystems and into the assemblies and components below it. And these form the indexing terms around the knowledge management structure. So how does the system work? So here, um, documents are indexed. These little dots represent the nodes that I've just described. So either the product, the function, the issue, or the design process. And then we apply, apply rules. These rules come for engineering knowledge. So we know a function and another product and another function should do the same, um, that you need to know what they're both doing. Or we need to know whether other products carry out the same function. And using these rules and weightings, we can use this to manipulate how these indexes look together and provide a visual picture back to the designers. So this is the bit that was patented in Rolls-Royce. Right, moving from there, that was been mainly the variant design industry to, to more customized industry, so more of the work in DTU. Part of the research has been looking at transfer of service knowledge to um, requirements. And this was done with G Giovanna Vinello, one of my PhD students who's now employed in Airbus. And um, this research looked at, if we have the product development uh, model, we have the after sales. And when we come to um, oil industry, the life of an oil rig is a very long life. So this after sales is very important. And what we were quite interested in is how can we transfer knowledge from this service and operations part on the oil, oil rig and on the oil drilling equipment back to produce better quality designs for the next generation. And in this industry, it's important because it's, a variant, it's not a variant design industry, which means you don't reuse the design, but you reuse the process and you reuse the knowledge behind it. And the approach that was done was some interviews at the headquarters of the company. And also, me and Giovanna ourselves were on board both of these rigs, one in Dubai and one in Christiansen, which were copies of each other to look at flows of how the changes between one rig and the next copy of the rigs carried out and how the transfer of knowledge was transferred. That was an interesting experience. <laughs> okay. So from that study, part of the things that we looked at were to understand change. So we did a comparative study of an error engine and looked at a number of reports from here to understand why does the engine change. And in this engine, I think over an eight year period, Six years is the product development and manufacturing and testing, and two years is the service period. 
there was one and a half thousand changes made to the product. And I have no idea if that's good or bad, because you could only compare to the company. But in the dr drilling machinery industry, we could see a typical, uh, if we looked at 1,200 changes of notifications, and we made a comparison over the types of changes that were made and the reasons behind this and what caused the changes. So some of the our findings show a lot of similarities despite the different types of industry. One is that most of these changes are discovered fairly late in the product development process. They're discovered in aerospace, in, typically in manufacturing and testing, where about uh, more than, well, about 75% of these changes were discovered here which means then you then have to go back and start a new development task before you can carry on again. And here, they were typically, um, um, typically discovered in the installation phase of the product. We also looked a bit deeper into the causes behind the changes. And for the aerospace industry, th these changes, um, the, cause, the main cause for the change was highly linked to the product development phase. And what we mean by this, in the development and prototype phase, weight is very important, and the specification is being developed, and there's a lot of um, systems that need to interface. So change in specification in one part affects the specification in another, leading to many changes in the development and prototype. In the manufacturing phases, most of these changes were related to manufacture, manufacturing or buildability of the product, and in the service phase, a lot of this was related to operational experience. From this, we're also looking at the service flow. When we looked at Arca Solutions, the company originally started its service flow by having a diagnostic. So if there was a problem on board um, an oil rig, a service engineer would be called out. They would identify the issue, look at, uh, analyze it, and make some sort of synthesis and a solution, which typically would be a spare part or some sort of maintenance report and a documentation taking place. And from this, knowledge of past experience from service um, was relevant. And what we did, what we found is that the service engineers, they were very much interested in the whole equipment and diagnosis of this. But in order to move this knowledge to the design of new set of equipment, we needed to know what the root cause of, of the problem was and link this to a component. Because equipment designers think in terms of only the component that they're working on and not the whole equipment. So some of the changes that took place here are the yellow parts, that instead of the process going like this, we introduce the idea of to bring in the root cause and link this to the component. And then this documentation to be fed back to the specifications, leading to product improvement for the next generation, and also to link the problem to the cause and solution, leading to faster diagnosis back up to the service engineers and also for the equipment engineers. And part of these changes that were made were both in terms of their databases and how they index knowledge, but also organizational changes. So it led to a change board being set up to look at changes which weren't serious. Often what happens in the oil industry, if you've got a very serious change, everybody reacts and changes it. If you've got a minor change that's repeated, it just goes through the system. And so they set up a board to pick up these minor problems which were repeated errors. So moving from there to another context, to the medical device industry. And this is the last case in engineering knowledge management, I promise, <laughs> which was that um, looking at, so in this perspective, the idea was to understand how to reduce failure and reduce product development times. And we talked about the error engine with 10,000 components or so that took seven, four to six years to develop. And in this case, we're looking at medical devices that also take four to six years to develop, but are only 20 components. And the complexity here comes from the reliability and the high level of robustness that's required from a safety-driven industry. So it does not come from the number of components involved. So for this product, this was done with Vinicius Marini, who just graduated last week, I think. And uh, what he did, he was analyzed um, a number of concepts um, for the, this insulin um, dispenser pen and mapped these concepts. So down here at the bottom, each of these rows represents each of those concepts developed and mapped these against the reasons why they failed, which were linked over here. And then when we looked at, in marked in red, we saw why they failed and if this reason for failure was carried on along in further concepts. And what we could see here 
is often the products where um, a concept that had failed was picked up in a further concept, and then the same concept would be failed again. And this led us to coming to the conclusion that the engineers need some better understanding of the working principles and what problems may be associated with them. So a proposal was made for a way of uh, organizing design records which show the working principles of the um, um, device. So in this part is the gear wheel of the, of the pen, describing it in terms of the function. So the function for the user is to set the dose and describing what sort of problems are involved. And it doesn't mean that you have to use this principle, but you at least become aware of what the problems are around it. Right, so and until now I've talked primarily about very engineering and complex problem, problems. And now I'm going to switch the scene a little bit to talk about consumer products. And this is, I think, what's common here, one is that we're trying to look at use at knowledge, and in this case it's user knowledge, but we're trying to make the intangible tangible. I think the past research has very much looked at experience design and tacit knowledge and of both um, the service engineers and operations division and also the engineers themselves. And this one focuses primarily on the consumers. So one phrase here that probably some of you have heard of is that attractive things work better. So this is, comes from emotional design theory where they believe that you can buy products because it looks better rather than it works better. And we're trying to make systems that make this understanding of why you're attracted to a product tangible. And the way that we've done this is, for example, with Mata, I think it's here as well, that we're looking at how to link ownership with perceptions. So why do you want to own a product to what you think of the product? And we do this by using very heavy statistical analysis. And then um, using this results can inform companies in how to make the design specifications with a chance of selling their product if it's a design-driven industry. And then we also try to link perceptions to aesthetics. So what we mean here is how you describe the product to what the product actually looks like. And if we could make some sort of rules that show that, okay, if the product has so many straight lines, for example, it's going to look more uh, aggressive or friendly, for example. And if we could embed these rules in artificial intelligence tools, can we get computers to predict what people would think of a product and what they're going to, if they're going to own the product ultimately? So some examples, we've done this in a number of different data sets ranging from, they're typically consumer products that are design-driven products and not very heavily engineering products. But um, so for example, here we've looked at fruit bowls, where we've looked at um, how users describe these um, products. And then from here, we can get an understanding of what ownership relates to. In this case, it's beauty and looking feminine. And this can inform design specifications in companies where they send a brief out to designers and ask them to design vases, which is the case in this company that we're involved in. Then what we do is we embed these rules. So we look at these products and we analyze them and say what's in common with them. And we create rules to describing their geometry and embed them in fuzzy logic systems, which are, is a, an artificial intelligence tool. And in this one, it says that if you use a combination of two or three rules, we could predict that we're going to evaluate this uh, concept of design the same way as a human would evaluate it. So just to test that, we then get humans to evaluate our forms and then we check it against a computer system and we can see here how close we are to them. So this research is a bit like a bit of fun on my side, but it's going to try and understand that can computers really assess aesthetics in the same way that humans can assess it? And I think the answer is yes. And the last project that I'm going to describe before we go further is that of um, also sticking on the theme of making the intangible tangible is to try and understand comfort. Comfort is often described as a very qualitative um, phenomenon. But when we're working with engineers, we don't want it to be a very qualitative phenomenon. So what we, if you typically in this design of headsets and other electronic industries, there's a phase where you have uh, designed the product and then you test it. And only in this prototyping and testing phase, issues with interaction and comfort become um, um, you become aware of them. 
And this means that you have a cycle going back and an iterative cycle. So our plan in this project was to try and understand if we can develop methods to improve and assess comfort very early on. So we can try and cut out this iteration and make a faster process. And behind us, Constantinus and Thomas, who are also in this room. So the approach that's been undertaken here, one, there wasn't enough data sets in, involved for um, this particular industry. So part of the approach is to look at predictive modeling using geometric data and capturing data of participants. I think there was about 200 participants who've had their ears measured. I'm an average, apparently. <laughs> and then with about six data sets for data points for each person. And cluster analysis approach have been used to try and understand if we can develop archetypes representing different types of user. And if we can do this, it means that even if we involve real users, we can create focus user panels. Instead of getting large numbers of people, we could reduce those numbers to only represent the archetypes of each data set. And then because of our little emotional design thing, the concept with emotional design is do uh, attractive things work better? And we're wondering, do attractive things interact better? Can we convince someone that something is more comfortable because it looks better? So we've done one study, a blind study, where we've looked at assessed comfort in, in um, headsets design, where they've assessed it blind and then reviewed it once they could see it. And what we can see is that there is a correlation in what you think of the product and how you assess it. So basically for at least a short period of time, you can convince somebody that a product works better or interacts better than it really does. That was a bit of fun over with, I'm sorry. <laughs> right, and coming back to what I'm working on now, we started with global product development. We have a large uh, fund from industry fund, the six million project that we're about, I think half a year into the project or so. And there's three themes behind here. One is the joint innovation models. So what I said before, with the challenge with globalization, I believe product development models and innovation models are not going to look like what they're described today. And so what, what we're trying to do is understand how will they look like and how can we create product development processes that facilitate joint innovation in the future. We've also got um, a project on measuring impact of global product development. So what are the key performance indicators that you need to assess whether a product has been successful a global product development has been um, successful or not. And the final is one is to look at decision-making tools. So we've had about 52 interviews through another PhD student with many of the vice presidents and CEOs involved in um, large manufacturing companies in Denmark. And part of this, we can see the process of outsourcing and sourcing is very much ad hoc and based on the footprint of the company. And what we want to do is try and facilitate um, the process of the decision making process in choosing whether to outsource and offshoring by making perhaps scenarios available or some sort of tool available. So we have a large amount of data, but we're now trying to get this data to a point where we can make a tool that could actually assist Danish industry. And we have a little related project to that, which is the one I think Vieta was referring to, where we partnered up with um, four of the top five institutes in China and look at the whole value chain from research idea generation to disposal in exchanging um, context between Chinese industry and Europe. And our focus being the design part is the design and development part of the project. And we've already had, I think, the first master's student back analyzing 10 ch companies and looking at Chinese product development models. There's very little literature available and most of it's in Chinese. And fortunately, the first student is also Chinese <laughs> as well. <laughs> Okay, so to conclude, I would say that the approach that, that I have, and I think that is following through in our group around us, is a very human-centered approach. So even though we use very qualitative tools, we use statistical tools, we use computational methods, we try and do this through understanding the product development process, from understanding knowledge of the engineers, knowledge of the service phase and the operation and the product, and through understanding the user, and then try to replicate this into tools and methods that can make this process faster. Yeah, I think that's about the size of it. I think. <laughs> and just coming back to the very beginning. So I said in the beginning that the European Innovation uh, Scoreboard, that Denmark is one of the leading um, countries in innovation. And I think 
Part of this research and our great creativity and idea generation through me and through others in the group who are hoping to support this. We've just got funding from a new design lab from the institution, which will facilitate the, this type of research. We hope that we'll have cameras and eye tracking equipment to be able to assess users very quickly, but also to assess engineers and designers. But also this could be a facility that could be used by companies who want to carry out some testing or uh, fast consumer testing through us. We hope that what I've said before, that I, with globalization, I believe this challenges innovation and product development models as they exist in literature today. But I believe that our new research hopefully will make an impact, at least in the joint innovation model side. Yeah. And then through the grand challenges, we've already done a body of research in this engineering knowledge management and of course looking at the global product development. And with that, I would like to say thank you very much for attending today. And I don't know what's the, is there questions? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Change the car. <laughs> <laughs> to, to see a presentation, and I think it was a brilliant example of that. We have a DTU professor here who, uh, in fact, uh, knows something about industry, industry problems and opportunities. Is strongly rooted in design engineering, new product development, innovation management. Is not afraid of matching those two by two things by by good tools, uh, research tools, research methods, and uh, and not the least is uh, uh, embraces the complexities of integrating users and the, the, the other persons, the engineer, into the problem. And I think that is a very attractive uh, thing. So you fit perfectly into our department and you fit perfectly into DTU and we're looking really <laughs> greatly forward to all your brilliant research projects in the future. So thanks a lot. And if some, I don't know, I, there were like three uh, flowers out there. So I'll just pick this one. I hope it's from, from our department. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> take it afterwards. But, Thank uh, you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. And we're looking forward to it. Thank you.